Electrothermal propulsion. Electrothermal rocket engines use electricity in some way to heat propellant before it is ejected out the nozzle. All propulsion systems boil down to two components, power and propellant. Until we can manipulate gravity or ride the sun's electromagnetic field lines, the only way to move a spaceship is to throw mass out the back. Even a photon rocket is throwing mass in the form of energy. To move our rocket faster, we have to throw mass out the back at a high velocity. The faster the mass is going, the more momentum it has and the more thrust it imparts in the opposite direction to the spaceship. To do this effectively, we need to give the mass kinetic energy. This can be done in several ways. As we have discussed, chemical rockets burn an oxidizer and a fuel generating heat, which increases the kinetic energy of the combustion products. The pressure in the combustion chamber increases, and an opening at one end allows the gas to escape in one direction, imparting thrust in the opposite direction. The highest temperature most rocket engine components can withstand is about 3000 Kelvin. Modern rockets run the fuel over the nozzle and combustion chamber to keep it cool and allow it to withstand high temperatures. The temperature and pressure in the combustion chamber determines the ejection velocity of the propellant. The ejection velocity of the propellant times the mass of propellant flowing through the engine determines the thrust. Chemical engines process a lot of propellant at a pretty high temperature and max out with a specific impulse of about 455 to 460 seconds. Specific impulse, remember, is a measure of rocket engine efficiency. If you take the ejection velocity and divide it by normal earth gravity, which is 9.81 meters per second squared, you get the specific impulse. Chemical bipropellant engines are big with lots of moving parts and usually limited restarts. The smaller thrusters that a spaceship needs to control its orientation or attitude in space are called reaction control systems, or RCS. They are also sometimes called vernier thrusters after Pierre Vernier, who developed a caliper with a large adjustment and a smaller fine adjustment setting. If you need two newtons of thrust with the same counter thrust to swing the nose of your ship toward the docking station, you can't use a big engine. These small systems can roll the ship, yaw it from side to side, or pitch it up or down. They can adjust its attitude for re-entry or docking and make minor changes to the orbit or maneuver in space. They will also sometimes be used to propel forward thrust to make the fuel and oxidizer move down toward the pipes that take them to the main pumps for the main engines. The pumps can't spin without fluid in them, or they might go too fast and tear themselves apart. These reaction control systems must be simpler and fire over and over again. The simplest possible rocket thrust is called a cold gas thruster. It uses compressed gas in a tank with a valve and a nozzle. When you open the valve, the gas expands into the nozzle and produces a little thrust. Very little though. Even when you are making small adjustments, you have to conserve your propellant. If your RCS system runs out of propellant, your mission is over. You can't fire your engines to re-enter the atmosphere if your ship is tumbling uncontrollably. Please review the course on hypergolic rocket engines to re-familiarize yourself with these systems. Now a cold gas thruster has a maximum efficiency of about 272 seconds if it uses liquefied hydrogen. This is the best. Methane is 105 seconds and nitrogen gas is only 73 seconds. But hydrogen is much harder to keep stored as it must be kept at about 20 Kelvin in one atmosphere which is extremely cold. Most nitrogen tanks of course have much more than one atmosphere of pressure. A nitrogen boils at 77 Kelvin in one atmosphere, making it a little easier to deal with, especially when pressurized. Now these tanks, of course, are pressurized and can be made of titanium with composite overwrap and can stand about 700 atmospheres of pressure. Thicker metal tanks can withstand up to 10,000 atmospheres, but they have a lot more mass. Using a thin metal to hold the gas and a carbon overwrap to prevent rupture saves a lot of weight. There's a practical limit to how much gas can be pressurized into a tank. Once this limit is reached, the thickness of the tank side will outweigh the benefit of storing more gas. The next simplest thruster is an electrothermal thruster called a resistojet thruster. This design heats the gas in a small chamber before it goes into the nozzle. This engine uses a resistor with electricity flowing through it to create heat. Think of tungsten wire in an old light bulb. The propellant is pumped around or through the resistor and absorbs the heat. This increases its kinetic energy. It expands more and has a higher ejection velocity than a simple cold gas thruster. However, remember that the laws of thermodynamics say that you cannot heat something more than the element that you're exposing it to. And since most materials 
cannot withstand more than 3,000 degrees centigrade, this limits the amount of power and efficiency you can get from your engine. But heating the cold gas does increase your specific impulse, and you can do more work with the same amount of propellant. A resistojet thruster using hydrogen can get a specific impulse of up to 700, with a power efficiency of up to 90%. But it can only process propellant fast enough to produce 5 millinewtons to 5 newtons. But this is enough for most satellite RCS and CubeSat needs. Now, some engines use monopropellant hydrazine over a catalyst to produce hydrogen and nitrogen gas, and then run those through a resistojet to increase the efficiency of the engine. The resistojet engine has been considered for long-range missions to Mars, but one limitation are the solar panels or the nuclear reactor needed to provide enough power. Near Earth, the available flux of power from the sun is a little less than 1400 watts per square meter on average. That power drops down to about 44% of that, so around 625 watts per square meter as you get to Mars. This makes solar power effective for missions from the Earth to the Moon, Venus, or Mercury, but not very effective further away from the sun. If you are going to use a nuclear power source for your electricity, there are arguments that other engine designs use the nuclear power more efficiently. Review the course on pulsed nuclear thermal engines to see what these are. The next engine type we will consider is called an arc jet thruster. It uses a circular anode around a central cathode. These are in the heating chamber and propellant, usually hydrogen or helium, is pumped into this chamber. An electric difference is created between the cathode and the anode and electricity arcs through the gas to complete the circuit. This is like a lightning bolt and can heat the propellant to very high temperatures. These can pulse at up to 20,000 Kelvin with a specific impulse as high as 2,300 but can only process enough propellant mass to get about again at most 5 newtons of force. It does have a problem with erosion of the arc generating components and is not used much. The Soviet Union did create a Teflon block as a propellant source and an arc to create a burst of plasma with the subsequent magnetic field accelerating the plasma out the nozzle. These are called magnetoplasma dynamic thrusters or MPDs and have been used in space. MPDs come in two types, applied field and self field. Applied field MPD thrusters use magnetic rings around the exhaust chamber to create the magnetic field that accelerates the propellant. The self field uses a cathode that extends through the center of the chamber to do the same thing. But now we are getting into ion drives, as it is the magnetic field that is accelerating the particles instead of thermal or heat energy. Another type of electrothermal thruster is a microwave thruster. It puts propellant in a chamber, microwaves it just like your oven at home to heat it, then lets it escape through a nozzle for thrust. Many of these now use water. Momentous Space uses microwaves just like this. It has multiple platforms using microwave water thrusters to get different masses to various orbits. The smallest is called Vigo Ride. It has a mass of 150 kilograms and can get 100 kilograms to lower Earth orbit in three days as a final stage with 93% of its propellant left over for orbital adjustments, corrections, and attitude control. It costs about $2 million. In this design, water vapor is put into the chamber Microwaves are generated and projected out of an antenna into the chamber where they are absorbed by the water molecules. The water heats to plasma temperatures and is allowed to exit through the nozzle to provide thrust. These engines are very efficient and only need electricity and water. This will be a popular method of propulsion in the future as water is safe to work with, available on most destinations in space and the specific impulse of these engines is two to five times what can be achieved with a chemical engine. These engines have a lot of potential and are a good compromise between mass propellant flow and specific impulse. Remember that while ion engines are very efficient, they can't generate much thrust. Chemical engines have a lot of thrust, but are less efficient and run out of propellant sooner. This type of microwave thruster is also being considered by scientists at the University of Central Florida, who have teamed up with a private space and mining tech company called Honeybee Robotics. They are developing a small microwave thruster-based spacecraft capable of reloading propellant from the asteroids, planets and moons it's exploring. By using in situ resources, this small lander could power itself for an indefinite number of flights, as long as it had power and access to water. This technology could be used on the Moon, asteroids, Ceres, Europa, Titan, Pluto, and Mercury, wherever there is water in sufficiently low gravity. Now let's review before we cover our most advanced electrothermal rocket engine. Cold gas thrusters are the simplest form of rocket engine, but they are very inefficient, meaning they use a lot of propellant to get a certain amount of thrust. Heating the cold gas with a resistor or arc increases the efficiency and thrust of these engines. These are the simplest electrothermal engines. Then we progress to microwave electrothermal engines like those designed by Momentous Space. And finally, let's look at the largest electrothermal rocket engine. We briefly discussed the Vassimer drive in our course on ion drives. 
but while the vasomer uses magnetic fields to manipulate the propellant in the form of plasma, it does not accelerate the propellant with electromagnetic fields. It uses an electromagnetic bottle to hold the plasma while it is heated with radio waves. Then it allows the propellant to flow through an electromagnetic nozzle providing thrust. This has the potential to be very efficient and provide considerable thrust. The pulse nuclear thermal rocket has more potential, but working with radioactive materials is expensive and complicated. The Vasimir engine has been built and tested in the suburb of Houston by Professor Chang Diaz. The variable specific impulse magnetohydrodynamic rocket has been in development for over two decades. This engine starts with a propellant tank. This propellant can be xenon for greatest efficiency. Any other noble gas can be used with somewhat less efficiency like argon, which is readily available on Earth and Mars. And hydrogen gas can also be used. Now when you have a heat source with a limited temperature, you want the lightest propellant particles possible because they reach higher velocities for the same temperature. For ion drives, you are using electromagnetic fields to throw an ion at a certain velocity. In this case, you want the most massive atom possible as your velocity is about the same and the momentum is determined by the mass. Use an atom with twice the mass of propellant and you get twice as much momentum change. Now the Vasimer ionizes the propellant gas in the first chamber as the gas leaves the tank. It does this with radio waves using a device called a helicon. Once the gas is ionized, it can be moved and controlled by electromagnetic fields. Powerful superconducting magnets are used to move the plasma along and keep it from coming in contact with the engine components. The next chamber uses another helicon and radio waves to heat the plasma to incredible temperature, actually higher than the heart of the sun. If the magnetic containment failed, the propellant would vaporize any material it contacted. The engine has a magnetic nozzle, which the heated plasma is allowed to exit through. As the ejection velocity is very high and the mass propellant flow is considerable, this engine design is very efficient. But to work, it needs a lot of electricity. To power this engine, solar panels would have to be enormous. It could function with nuclear energy, but then you run into the issues of just using the heat of the nuclear reactor to generate more thrust or use the electricity generated by your nuclear engine in a simpler design of thruster like the resistojet or microwave thruster or use pulse nuclear thermal propulsion. In the end, these electrothermal thrusters are a good compromise for small payloads, but for something really big, pulse nuclear thermal will always be superior. Fusion power generators could provide enough power for the Vasimer design, but once you have fusion, there are other ways to produce enormous thrust with high efficiency. These issues are why Dr. Robert Zubrin is not very fond of this engine design. It is a very elegant design and could be an effective engine for deep space probes that went first to Venus, dropping off probes, then to Mercury, dropping off more, and finally looping near the sun like the Parker Solar Probe. 